Hello, I'm Andrew Hall, and this is Dead Hand Radio. My guest for this episode is Preston Dennett. He's a returning guest on this podcast. He's an author, UFO researcher, and a ghost hunter. Preston has been searching for answers to questions that most people have long been afraid to ask, and he's been doing it for over 30 years. In this episode, Preston is going to share his wealth of knowledge and help us understand the question of UFOs, who or what, is driving them. Thanks for being here, Preston. You're muted, Preston. Oh, I can't I'm muted. Hear Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for so, having yeah. me. <laughs> welcome, welcome back to Dead Hand Radio, man. It's always a pleasure yeah. having you on. Hey, hey, thanks. Thanks very much. Yeah. So, real quick, as we always do, um, just in case we're running, you know, we we run across some new viewers who are not familiar with you. Would you please just give a brief history? of how you got interested in UFOs and, you know, what compels you to continue researching them? Uh, a brief history. All right. Well, it's been 35 years now, so it's been a while. Uh, 1986, November 17, heard a report on the news about a sighting over Alaska by a pilot. It's a very famous sighting. Didn't believe it for a second, but started asking family, friends, coworkers what they thought of this poor deluded pilot and uh, found out a lot of people I knew were having encounters, checked out some books, trying to disprove it. This whole subject uh, wasn't able to. <laughs> uh, found out this pilot was not deluded. Uh, it had sudden he had appeared on radar. There was multiple witnesses. Uh, that's what started the ball rolling. It took me a year or two to really sink my teeth into this subject and find out that UFOs are very real. There's a government cover-up. A lot of people are having these encounters and started doing, you know, I joined MUFON, a bunch of other organizations. And uh, yeah, just that's how it all started. Awesome. So it's been a uh, pretty wild ride because um, over the course of your, your experience with this topic, you went from skeptic, non-believer, to 100%, no questions asked, knowing what what these things are, um, and have had your own experiences as well. Um, and the thing that impresses me and that I appreciate the most about you is that you are not afraid to share your thoughts on these topics, your position. And you don't make any apologies for it. And uh, I'm proud to know you, man. I appreciate what you do. You're doing good work for this for this community and for the greater uh, population of the world. Hey, yeah, thanks. I, I appreciate that, too. Well, yeah, I'm not embarrassed about UFOs for whatever reason. I'm just willing to talk about it. I know people are, there's a lot of ridicule surrounding this subject. And I've cleared a few rooms at, at parties and stuff, but. I mean, what's true is true. We, sh we should not be afraid of truth. Absolutely. And uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, this rocked my world. And I mean, it hit me like a ton of bricks. I was not happy about it initially. Um, you know, I've kind of come around. I think this is just fascinating stuff. Really interesting. I think a really important subject too. It's important. I mean, you know, a lot of people say it's the most important question in the history of of humanity that's probably true but a lot of people get caught up in the day-to-day -day routine of their lives and they don't really think about the bigger picture so for people like yourself who are continuously pushing this topic um and who have received recently a little bit of validation from the mainstream media from the u.s government um, even though that was never really your focus or your goal, your, your goal is to educate the masses. Um, right. But you have been recently getting some validation um, from not, not only the U.S. government, uh, other governments around the world have been starting to, 
to bring their information forward. And some members of the scientific community are starting to wake up and look into this topic as a serious topic. And then uh, along with that, the mainstream media, the giggle factor is all but gone in, uh, in uh, interviews that I see nowadays. Yeah, finally. Such a, yeah, such a pleasant relief to see the, the way things are going. Um, real quick, let's talk a little bit about your, um, you know, a, as I said, you, it's not a big deal to you that the government is starting to come forward with some information. Um, but what is your opinion on the recent uh, release of the UAPTF report? Yeah, no, it is and isn't a big deal. I mean, I'm kind of pleased to see it. Like you said, it's, it is validation to a certain extent, but it's just more lies. I don't think we're ever going to be able to look towards our government for the truth on this subject, to be perfectly honest. If they are moving this slowly, saying, well, it could be drones, it could be a foreign power, it could be, you know, airborne clutter. <laughs> that was one of my favorite explanations they had in this recent report. Uh, and they couldn't even go there and say, it's aliens and we know it. And they do know it. So I'm really disappointed, honestly. I'm disappointed. And I just don't trust them anymore. And I don't think we're going to, I don't think we should look to them for guidance on this subject. They've shown themselves to be liars and are still lying. Uh, and yeah, it is movement. But to say, oh, we, maybe we should begin to study this. I'm like, Ooh, hold on here, begin to study this. And this is what you know really pisses me off the most. They've been studying this for 70, 80 years. They know what it is. They know it's aliens. So it's completely disingenuous. And uh, people who say, you know, UFOs don't affect my life. You know, I've never seen one. Why should I care? Your government is spending an enormous amount of money on this subject, studying it and covering it up. It does affect you. It's a good point, uh, Preston. And I, I had not actually looked at it that way, but you know, for for a civilian researcher like yourself and and many others, there are hundreds or thousands of researchers to come to the conclusion that you have because of the research and your experiences. For the U.S. government not to have come to that conclusion as well, either they are lying or they don't understand, they don't have a clue. So either one of those scenarios is an, a pretty uncomfortable situation. If our government's lying to us, <laughs> it's one thing. If they don't have a clue what's going on, that's, a I think, even scarier situation, don't you? Yeah, yeah, and I just cannot imagine that it's the latter it takes, you know, what, 10 minutes to look into this and see that there's something to it. The number of witnesses, the landing trace cases, the implant removal cases, the medical effect cases. I mean, come on. Well, and the, the fact that none of that was mentioned in that report right. just tells you that either they're not looking at those factors, at which I, I cannot believe that they're not looking at those factors. Yeah. Uh, the or they're lying is, about it. Yeah. The report is all about sightings, recent sightings. Yeah. So my, um, you know, I'm not, I, I don't want to discount what you're saying. hundred percent agree with what you're saying. I'm sort of coming around to that um, perspective myself. When I first saw the report, I was expecting Condit 2.0. I was expecting absolute denial uh, or a delay you know, a six month extension on the thing like they were talking about. So when I saw the report, I was pretty happy. Honestly, I saw some things in there that I thought were pretty cool. 144 reports. Most of those reports were done in the last two years. Um, out of those reports, 80 of the reports were uh, tracked with multiple um, types of tracking, you know, multiple, whether it's radar or, you know, FLIR or something, you know, I thought those things were positive. And then yeah. in talking with people like yourself and other researchers who had been looking at the, and see, the other thing is I've only been looking at this for about a year, seriously. Um, you know, that's why I look to people like yourself for the information uh, because I've only been looking into this for a short time relatively. Uh, 
but I'm starting to come around to the idea that that report was just a, a bunch of hogwash. It was like a it was like a pin. They they put a pin in the topic to buy themselves more time to figure out what to say. And then supposedly there's a 90 day report coming out or a 90 day update that's coming out. What are your thoughts on that report? Yeah, that's what I want to see uh, because this is a tiny, tiny step forward. It is a complete 180 degree reversal on their previous stance, which you know, Project Blue Book, the Common Committee and the Robertson panel all said, there is nothing to this, nothing. And now they're saying there is something to it it could represent an advanced technology. So that's 180 degrees from their previous stance, and that's good news. Uh, but to say that there's no evidence of extraterrestrials, when they know, they flat out know, is completely disingenuous. So we'll see what this 78-page report is, uh, because they absolutely know this is a technology. I mean, they have the craft. They have the bodies. They know what this is. And they're doing their best still to cover this up. And they cannot cover it up anymore. The evidence is so overwhelming that this is what's forcing disclosure. I don't think they're doing this voluntarily at all. This is a, st yeah. a step to sort of control the masses, to control our perception of this phenomena. At some point, I think they will say this is extraterrestrials. And the rumor is they're going to call it, you know, evil, a threat, a hostile takeover, which is so absurd because you got to remember these guys have been around for millennia or thousands upon thousands of years, longer than we have. Do you really think they're going to take over? It just doesn't make sense. Uh, but yeah, 70, I cannot wait to see that report. And I'm thinking we're going to get a little bit more, another tiny step forward. That's not where disclosure is going to come from. It's not going to come from our government. It's clear to me now. It's going to come from the people. It's going to come yes. from the ETs. It's going to come from another government. And I, I think one thing you said that I absolutely agree with, not that I disagree with anything you said, but one thing I want to emphasize is that the um, the disclosure process right now, that what, what we're getting from the government right now, it's forced. We're, it, they, they have so much pressure on them from wherever it's coming from that they're that they're spoon feeding this information out to the public just to appease they're trying to put a band-aid on a on a uh, a sucking chest wound right if you will. <laughs> okay they're, they're trying to put a band-aid but it, it's going to come out um nick madrid says congressman andre carson of indiana said sunday that he wants congress to conduct hearings on purported sightings of ufos in the wake of a pentagon report I think, Nick, that's a great comment that you made, and that's one of the questions I wanted to ask Preston's opinion about. But I think everybody who has any interest in this topic wants to see that. What do you? What, how do you feel about that, Preston? Yeah, yeah. Let's put push this into you know the legislative arena. Uh, this would not be the first congressional hearing on UFOs. Uh, this has been brought up before. After the uh, Michigan sightings, there was a congressional hearing. James McDonald, scientist, was there. Uh, Jalen Hynek, uh, some really major scientific minds, gave a presentation to Congress, and it didn't go anywhere. Uh, and yeah, this this whole subject is very tightly controlled by the military-industrial complex, the people who are actually behind this cover-up. Uh, and I'm not so sh I'm not certain how much power Congress has <laughs> over this, but they do have a platform, a very powerful platform. And I think at some point uh, it needs to be used. And they do have the ability to push this subject open, despite you know the people who are actively trying to cover up. Uh, they have a lot of power <laughs> to just end the cover-up and that needs to happen if we are going to move forward as a society we need to face the truth and the truth is ufos are real and they're aliens they are aliens wait wait don't don't give any spoilers away, man we we got <laughs> we got a whole show to get through before we get to what they are 
<laughs> All right. <laughs> well. Okay, good. So um, Matthew says that the, the recent French report on UAPs was far more insightful. Uh, I have not read that report, Matthew, but I do know that there have been other countries that are coming out with UFO data uh, reports. Some of them are coming from the, the civilian community or the scientific community within those uh, countries. And, and some of them are coming from the government. I'm not sure which is, is which, but that's good to know if, uh, if other governments are starting to come out with their information. That's going to also put pressure on the U.S. because the U.S. doesn't want to be left behind. I'm, right. I'm talking about the U.S. military. They don't want to be left behind. Yep. Could be Chile. Could be Brazil. Could be Mexico, Canada, France, Russia, China. I mean, we don't know who's going to bust this open, but whoever does it first is going to be a step ahead of everyone else. Yes, agreed. Uh, uh, so Nick Madrid uh, took a quote from Medium. Uh, the website medium. I'm absolutely certain that the United States government has recovered non-human technology that is not of this world. And that technology includes craft Ross Coulthart. Uh, right. That's cool. Apparently he has a movie out, which I have not had a chance to watch it. Um, do you happen to know the name of his movie? And if anybody else uh, wants to chime in on what his movie is, um, Please throw it up there and, and we'll share that. But uh, no, that's... I, I, I haven't seen it yet. No, I don't okay, know. Cool. So, but, yeah, uh, I mean, guys like that, uh, I think he's a, a reporter from Australia, uh, unless I'm mistaking him for somebody else. But um, guys like that coming out and talking about this openly and publicly and confirming what you already know, that's going to continue also to put pressure on the U.S. government. But it's also going to free up their hands um, for fear of reprisal or ridicule or whatever it may be to come forward and, and admit what they know, right? Yeah, yeah. The whole UFO crash retrieval aspect, I think it's one of the most sensitive and aspects of ufology. One of the areas of research that has the most potential for sure, because that's the absolute proof. That is the conclusive evidence. And what I love about this is, yeah, it's the very best evidence. And what I and hate about it is it's relying completely, at least in the public arena, on eyewitness testimony. Yeah. Like Roswell, we don't, where is the metal? You know, where is this? Show us these hundreds of craft. All we have is eyewitness testimony. Roswell is the great case because there's what, 300 witnesses or something. And there's Kexper, you know, there's the Aztec crash, the Paradise Valley crash. There's a lot of these. And some well, very high-level high witnesses, too. But the, the crash that brought you and I together was the Kingman crash, the King, Kingman yeah. UFO crash. And then since then, I found out that there have been two other, well, a crash and a landing in Ely, Nevada. Uh, there, there's a researcher who lives here in La, Las Vegas who's done extensive research, talked to witnesses uh, about a craft that landed there, I think it was in 1957, and then another crash that crashed there in 19 around 1963, up in that area. Apparently, yeah. they were hovering over a uh, some kind of a mine, a silver or a copper mine, which is one of the things that you said they seem to have an interest in. For sure, yeah. There's and more than that. Uh, one book I would point to is uh, Rachel's Eyes by Helen Littrell, uh, who she talked to a colonel who you know, worked in Nevada, and he, he described a bunch of incidents. Uh, uh, there's a lot. I, you know, I've written books like UFOs over California, Nevada, and various other states, and they all have these crash retrieval incidents. I cannot wait for that particular aspect to really, you know, come into the public arena. Yeah. Because there we have the proof, the proof, the proof. Right, and not only... Not only is that the proof but that is the material that can be studied by the scientific community to really break open and kind of advance our own technology and science medical uh you know and and just help evolve humanity to a new level right if that material comes out to the public and we get to study it 
and use it to to develop our own tech based on that I and mean, is that a good thing for humanity or not oh yeah yeah i think probably i mean according to a number of sources a lot of our technology already is sourced from et technology of course there's the colonel corso who was viciously attacked by a number of i think probably paid debunkers uh, but he's got a sterling reputation and never could you know pin him down as a hoaxer or anything like this and he said flat out uh, integrated circuits fiber optics night vision kevlar all came directly from the roswell incident and i don't know i you know i tracked down some of these inventions and it's not apparent that this is where they came from certainly in the public arena but he has an explanation for that he says that they were fed to these uh inventors in ways that were very secretive very surreptitious uh so yeah i absolutely think it is good news for us the healing technology been a number of whistleblowers who've said that we have an incredible healing technology taken from these uh craft that have been recovered technology that you know x-rays and uh, can heal flesh wounds uh pinpoint tumors any tumor in the body instantly and just a really magical star trek like uh technology which would revolutionize medicine which unfortunately is also being suppressed because you know me medicine is a business true it, sh it shouldn't be no no it absolutely it should is. not be same thing with energy energy should not be a business i mean that should be available to everybody for free if tesla had his way nikolai tesla not elon musk nikolai tesla had his way we would have free energy already um free medical if we have the technology why is it being suppressed why is it be being used by the military to develop more advanced weaponry you know m better ways to kill each other rather than help humanity and uh, precisely you, yeah. you're starting to get me fired up now preston <laughs> this is why i'm so angry i mean i get these it guys, man these guys do not have our best interests in mind period they're not good guys <laughs> And it's pretty upsetting to know that they have this technology and are keeping it secret just out of greed and corruption and power. I think that is one of the main forces behind the cover-up. Uh, and it's really unfortunate that there's not higher morals within you know, our leaders, a higher moral standard. Mm. I agree. I, I, we could talk about this. I mean, for a whole show uh but i'd really like to turn it to a different conversation because this type of conversation is going on on a lot of channels right now i think a lot of people are talking about exactly what what you're saying um but i'd really like to turn the conversation to something a little bit more positive a little bit more interesting and uh stimulate the imaginations and get people's interest you know peak peak people's interests um one class closing note on this part of the conversation though. Uh, JTP says Ross talking about Ross Coltar said some very interesting things lately, especially that the USAF is actively trying to block any investigation into the topic. A quote from Ross <laughs> says they are pissed. Uh, that, that's <laughs> yeah. not surprising. <laughs> What's your reaction to that? Yeah. Welcome to the club. <laughs> We're all pissed at each other. Cause yeah, I imagine there's a lot of division going on within the whole cover-up community, I'll call it. Uh, I don't think that everyone who's in the know necessarily wants this covered up. I'm sure there's some good people in there uh, just because, you know, there's a bell curve and all sort of human behavior. Uh, but yeah, I can imagine that they're angry because this information is coming out despite their best efforts to keep it suppressed. And wh what do they think? I mean, this is an a wave this is an ocean coming at them a tsunami of information they cannot dam this up you know like one of the analogies i really like and i think is really accurate is a a dam with a thousand leaks springing in it and they're putting their fingers on each one of these holes 
and now the dam is so weakened it's about to collapse. Uh, so yeah, I can see they're probably pissed, <laughs> angry, and a little bit scared uh, because at some point heads will roll. This is illegal what they're doing. This is against the Constitution. Uh, this is something all humanity has the right to know. This is a big, big deal, um, what they've done, covering up all this technology and this information. Uh, so we'll see how it all rolls out. But at some point, you cannot hide the truth forever. It's like trying to hide the sky. I mean, you just yeah. can't do it. Good, good point. Uh, Nautical Strings says, oh, come on. There were nine UFOs at S4. They all know it. Thanks for your comment, Nautical. Uh, and then Nick Madrid says, good morning, Preston. I'm a giant fan. Always great to see you on the show. Nick is an awesome dude. Uh, he and I chat on Twitter often, a lot of it behind the scenes. Um, and he's a very well-informed individual. Thanks for being here, Nick. It's always a pleasure to see you coming out. Um, uh, Scott Brown, another another good friend of mine, um, very solid researcher in his own right, uh, asks, has Preston found any other cases that are similar to the 1977 Corrales case? Cor oh, Colares, I think. Oh, sorry. Uh, is what he's mentioning there, um, if, if I'm correct, uh, down in Brazil. And no, that's a very hostile series of events in which UFOs, they called them chupas, were sending out beams of light and essentially really harming people and uh, in some cases, they passed away. And there are a few incidents here and there where people have been struck by a beam of light from a UFO and suffered radiation sickness. Um, in a number of these cases, it was because the people were shooting at the UFO. Uh, but looking into the Colares case, uh, it's very controversial. One of the main researchers ended up committing, quote, suicide, we'll call it. Uh, I wonder if he was, you know, rubbed out. Uh, I am not so sure that that wasn't a, how would I put this, a disinformation campaign uh, on the part of the, the people who are doing the cover-up to make ETs look bad. I don't have any proof of this, but I can tell you I've talked to some contactees who are very much in touch with ETs, the Greys, uh, who said, no, that wasn't us. <laughs> That was not ET, that was government. Um, again, I don't have proof of that, but I think we've got to leave our options open here because it's a largely unique series of events. Uh, ETs, generally speaking, are not hostile like that. Uh, I don't want to say all ETs are our friends because I don't think they are, uh, but I've never seen a series of events like that before or since, and I really wonder about it. Uh, thanks for your question, Scott. You guys always have such amazing questions and insight when you guys uh, join the, the conversation. That's why I, I love to hear from the chat, and, and I share every one if I can. Um, Nick Madrid again says, oh, this is the uh, the movie by Ross Coltart. It's called A Phenomenon, but not to be confused with The Phenomena by James Fox. Yeah, um, I did see Phenomenon, the Fox documentary, which was really well done. It's mostly classic cases. I think someone who's steeped in re research won't learn a whole lot new. It sure was nice to see you know, the witnesses to the like McMinnville, Oregon photograph, one of the best UFO photographs out there, never been debunked. Or Father Gill, the New Zealand case, interviewed him. A really well done documentary. Uh, I'm interested to see the other one, Phenomenon, or The Phenomenon. Uh, there's a number of documentaries I want to see. I really want to see that one coming out about the aerial case. The aerial That's story right. Yeah. Is that is that a documentary or is that kind of a, like a, a biop, like a, a reenactment type of a movie? Do you know? I believe it's a documentary with interviews. Um, oh, they okay. might do reenactments, which is always fun. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, as far as I know, it's a documentary. Yeah, that's that's really an interesting case. I mean, it's hard to uh, it's hard to dispute that many witnesses, you know. And it's already been proven. I, I think John Mack, the uh, the regressive hypno 
therapist who did so much work for so many years uh, was involved in that case. Yep. Yep. Cynthia Hind, John Mack. Uh, now a lot of people. Randall Nickerson is the one who's doing the uh, documentary. And that's been, I don't know what's taking it so long, but apparently he's had a lot of obstacles putting this out. Yeah, uh, well. But boy, when it comes out, that's going to be big. Uh, Scott, I'm not sure what you were referring here to. Uh, he is a member of ITF. Was that, um, is that Ross Coltart? And I, I'm not sure what the ITF is. If you could expound on that, I appreciate it, man. Um, so yeah, with that, man, we'll stop. Uh, we'll stop beating up the government. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I guess in fairness, they're doing the best that they can do with what they've got. Uh, uh, you know, <laughs> no, <laughs> maybe giving a little too much credit there, but uh, yeah, no, they, they. You know what? The the more pressure that we put on them, the more they're going to have to acquiesce, and I think that's we're starting to see the results of that pressure. That's I, I think it's to their program. benefit. I really do. Yeah. If they want to retain control of the subject in any way, they're going to have to say this is extraterrestrial or that they know more than they're saying that it yeah, is a technology. But, uh, but uh, again, we don't want them to have control of it. You know, we want that to be available to the public for study and, and development you know, and just so that we can advance our culture, advance the world. You know, if we, if we could find a way to heal cancer, how, how good would that be for humanity? Um, exactly. <clears throat> anyway, so what we're going to do next is really fun. This is, this is going down uh, a little bit different rabbit hole than that one. That's a, that's a rabbit hole that gets everybody pissed off. This kind of a rabbit hole, in my opinion, is a lot more fun and a lot more interesting. Stimulates people's interest in the topic. Um, allows people to really take a little bit of a break from the hardcore, like thinking about what the government has in their hands. Um, we're talking about WTF is driving these things. <laughs> that's the title of the uh, well I didn't use WTF I said who or what who or what is driving them um, and first of all let's say let's talk a little bit about the types of UFOs you and I've had this conversation several times but I want to I want to just go down and um, talk about the different types because it's it's kind of weird to me like if if there are so many different types of craft does that mean that each type of craft has a different type of occupant involved with it? You know, yeah, and yeah. and just just for an example, so right off the top, triangles is one type of craft. Uh, Foo Fighters, orbs, and fireballs could be could be categorized as a diff as a you know a, a type of craft. Um, saucers and discs, kind of similar. Spheres, V-shaped and boomerang. Cigars, eggs, and Tic Tacs, egg-shaped or oval-shaped. <laughs> and Tic Tacs could kind of all be uh, categorized or grouped together. Cubes and rectangles, which is different than spheres or triangles. So you got basically uh, the three major geometric type of shapes. Um, shape-shifting, and that's the scariest one to me, the shape-shifting craft that change, right. and those to me freak me out for some reason. And then there's the cross or the star type of uh, craft and other, you know, there's, there's some other weird type of craft like barbell looking things or, you know, and I probably left some out, but Yep, uh, did. <laughs> did. Did I? Okay, you want you want to go down down the list no, and not, add to it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you covered a lot of I, asymmetrical is one I would say, just weird like hexagonal uh, shapes. I mean, there is every shape under. I mean, in the in the book, uh, it's one after another, and yeah, I really am intrigued by the idea possibility that 
we could correlate shapes of craft to the type of ET inside. Because there hasn't been a lot of research done into that. Um, no one's, as far as I know, really been able to conclusively prove that boomerangs are flown by this or, you know, saucers are flown by that. So it's still, huh, this is a new subject, really, even though we've been in it for decades. We don't know a lot about it. Uh, welcome, Luis. Uh, the Unidentified Celebrity Review. One of the things we were talking about earlier was the 90-day report and the, um, the potential public hearings. And Luis is putting together a new big phone home on his channel prior to that 90 day report coming out. So, uh, okay. heads up on that to everybody. Lou, as soon as you get that date, uh, let me know, man. And we'll do, um, we'll do a show on dead hand radio to help get the word out to, to this audience. And then I know that you got a big audience. Um, but it, it's awesome what you're doing, man. So, keep doing it and thanks for being here um so jumping back to the types of craft and what i said before i listed off those craft is is every type of craft have a different type of occupant in it i would not i, I mean yes and no uh, i i think there's a wide variety of gr grays and it's apparent to me that a lot of what we're seeing what's probably piloted by grays because that's the majority of reports we're getting uh, but i don't know i mean there's many different types of vts and uh, there's a, a lot of different theories that are being entertained to explain this stuff i mean there's possibly time travelers oh wait um, that's that's the next that's the next <laughs> section man I, okay <laughs> All right, I won't jump ahead, but yeah, I mean, that, I mean, uh, is this a spiritual phenomenon? <laughs> you know, I mean, there's all these different explanations. Is this some, an intelligence that wears different masks? All these different, you know, uh, is this government? <laughs> this is, is really raising the question is who is flying these things? Uh, yeah, I, I guess it's hard not to talk about the craft themselves and say, you know, who's driving these things and not talk about actually who it could be driving, <laughs> right? But uh, so let's go back to the the, the craft themselves. Um, all right. The uh, first of all, the triangle. It, now, it, until yesterday, actually, I thought I was I was under the impression that the majority of triangles were human, like reversed engineered um, type of craft that were uh, that you know, cause we're seeing the triangles. I was reading a book by Ingo Swan where he encounters a triangle craft, but the way this thing appears, it kind of grows into existence and there's all this lightning and smoke and cloudy, you know, uh, glowing stuff, um, going on. So I thought, okay, maybe the, the triangles, are not human tech. Maybe they, there's something else. Um, I think a lot of the triangles could be misidentified because you've, you've got the B2, the F-117, and now there's some new stuff coming out. Even the, uh, the F-22 and the F-35 Raptor or the F-22 Raptor, F-35, whatever it is, those look like triangular craft if you, know, if you don't really know what you're looking at. So I think a lot of triangle craft are misidentified, but I think the legit triangles that people are seeing, I think that those are probably non-human tech. Agreed? Um, I don't know, because um, uh, there's a lot of buzz now about triangular craft. And I agree with you that there's a lot of misidentifying going on, particularly with the boomerang shape. People are calling these triangles because they look like triangles at night. And uh, they might not be triangles. Good point. And there's like manta ray shaped UFOs and ones that look vaguely triangular, but might not be your standard equilateral triangle. Uh, and I do know of cases which I am convinced are extraterrestrial with their standard triangular craft. 
But when spuds started going around, like, oh no, most triangular craft are government. I started, like, huh. I started looking to my own cases. And I got a real surprise there. I found very, very few <laughs> um, descriptions of triangular craft where people have been taken on board uh, and saw ETs. Hmm. I found a couple. I mean, there's one book which I think is pretty convincing, The Black Triangle Abduction. I talked to the guy who, his last name was Foster, I believe. Bill, Fo yeah, that's right, Bill Foster. I think that was ET. But the more I look into this, I'm thinking, mm, most of these are probably military. Uh, like the one that flew over Illinois, there's a lot of buzz in the year 2000. That was a triangular craft. That prop probably was military. The Phoenix Lights, a number of people described that as triangular, when really it was boomerang. I don't think that was uh, government. Uh, this is a, an area of research that is pretty controversial right now. Uh, and I'm leaning towards these triangular craft, the standard equal, you know, right triangles, equilateral triangles being military. Uh, but we, I think we have to leave our options open. Yeah. Because uh, we, until we know, we, we don't know. Uh, but I've talked to some contactees and they're like, mm, no, the, most of those triangles are not ET. That's government. The T, what's it called? The TR. B3, yeah. TR3B, yeah. Yeah, that's obviously <laughs> military and it looks like a UFO. I mean, it really does. It's mostly silent, it's quite huge. Uh, so we have to be really, really careful, particularly these days. You know, 30 years ago it was a different story, but now this technology is being reverse engineered. Uh, so we have to be very careful when we're looking at these objects and trying to decide who is in them, who's piloting them. Cool. Uh, so Luis says that we have the dates. Are you okay if I bring him on real quick? We'll give him about five minutes to talk about the the uh, the next oh, yeah. Yeah. big phone. Yeah. Okay. That'd be awesome. Yeah. I'm going to throw you the uh, link in Twitter on the, the uh, direct message there, Lou. Jump in when you get a chance and... Um, We'll give you a few minutes to talk about the the next big phone home. I'm excited about that. Um, so, yeah, the um, I, I think a lot of these uh, shapes and craft that we've talked about could be misidentified um, for other things. What's what's the one type of craft that you think? is unmistakably non-human tech that we have no, there's no way we could have possibly uh reverse engineered to create something that looks like this uh the giant giant boomerang ones like the phoenix lights which right. was described yeah. as you know a quarter mile half mile in length come on yeah. to build that <laughs> um and the, the standard flying saucers the huge, huge mother ships that people describe, which you know release all these other the transmogrifying craft, you know, the ones the that shape, change shape. 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 Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, there's a number of them that clear clearly aren't uh, our technology. Um, they they go far back, far too long. Early 1920s and 30s and 40s. I doubt we had this technology. What is the most intriguing? craft or shape of a craft that that you have studied and and it also i forgot to ask you a, a listener question from a previous episode so first of all talk about what's your what's the most intriguing shape of the craft that you've studied and then i i, I would like you to answer a question from a listener from a previous episode yeah, well, as far as intriguing, the most intriguing, that's a difficult question because I'm intrigued by all of them. <laughs> and um, I'm just fascinated by the standard flying saucer because they've been around for so long and they're still here. It's the most common shape and it seems to be designed in a way that is ideal for interdimensional travel or space travel or however you want to put it. Uh, but the boomerangs, yeah, those fascinate me because uh, 
they're often described as so darn big. Uh, and it's just a strange shape to have, you know, no center to it. Uh, it's just these long kind of a big giant V. That intrigues me. Uh, yeah, but all of them, the spheres, that's really interesting. You know, because how are the, where's the engine in those? You know, how, do, are, the, how are the decks situated? I'm really intrigued in what's inside UFOs. People mm -hmm. are like, oh, all about sightings, sightings. I'm like, wait, let's think about what's actually inside these things. That to me is really the most intriguing part of this subject. And you uh, are not just a researcher, you're an experiencer, an eyewitness yourself, if you will. Um, and on a previous episode, you shared that experience or one of the experiences. By the way, uh, okay, <laughs> uh, I have so many questions that I forgot to ask you. Uh, how was your um, how was your speaking engagement? at the uh ufo um what, uh, what was mega con yeah. mega con that's the one yeah how did that go oh it went fantastic okay uh, yeah that. in fact i haven't been able to verify this but uh i did i did get a standing ovation that was awesome very cool man. and Congrats. Uh, i think i've had a number of people tell me i was voted most valuable presentation mvp awesome so I'm like, wow, that's cool. If yeah. true, I, I have not been able to verify it from the first-hand source, but um, oh, yeah, it, went, it went really, really well. That's great, man. I'm glad to hear that. So the listener question I wanted to get to, and then Lou just dropped in. I'll, I'll uh, bring him in as you're answering the question. So, And this is related to your uh, experience um, or your experiences uh, of witnessing these, these craft yourself. How do you know that the, these craft – that you've witnessed are not military or reverse engineered tech. Right. Um, well, I mean, it's just in general, you know, not my own experiences. It's, it's clear they're not military because there's aliens inside of them. People are even taken on board and seeing aliens, but the ones I've seen, and I have had a number of encounters, um, you know, a half dozen really good ones, uh, probably closer to a dozen. And some very intense, well, I'll call them, and I'll put this in air quotes, <laughs> UFO dreams or alien dreams. Because uh, I think they might be more than that. Uh, but yes, uh, well, one I saw was this tiny little orb which came up to my car, my windshield, and I had missing time. I don't remember what happened after this thing darted away. I should have turned around and told my brother I just left his house and said, I saw I, I don't know if that was military. <laughs> How, uh, but one case I know for sure isn't military because it spoke to me telepathically. Yeah, right. And, and said flat out, we are the ET. You know, I was transcribing an interview from a contactee and waffling on whether or not she was, I mean, I knew she was telling me the truth, but this was a hard story to swallow. Hybrid babies and so on. It's just a very, very extensive case. And I had a very strong impulse to go onto the roof of my condo. It's kind of a long story, so I won't get too into it, but that imp the fact that I had the strong impulse, the fact that they spoke to me and said, you know, Wendy's case is real. <laughs> you don't believe, watch this. Spoke to me telepathically. Uh, I, that convinced me that it wasn't uh, government. But ultimately, I mean, you. You can't know for sure until you're taken on board. And even then you have to be careful because they have ways of convincing people. There is you know, a whole MK Ultra and mind control. They are some nasty guys with some pretty advanced technology. We have to be pretty careful. Cool stuff. And for anybody that would like to hear more about uh, Preston's firsthand accounts, uh, he and I did a, a, a few episodes back, he and I did a, an extensive interview about those uh accounts and right now joining us for a quick um update to let us know about the next big phone home luis jimenez my friend my fellow podcaster what's happening man thanks for welcome to dead hand radio brother thank Dude, you for always being a here. pleasure always a pleasure to, to speak with you Preston, how you doing doing good thanks good good good, good. Uh, nice to meet you um so I can't give you dates yet. What? 
I can't give you dates yet. Uh, I thought you said in the chat you had dates. I do. I do have the uh, dates. I do have the dates, but we're going to do it as, you know, a big release. So that way we can okay. have as much as attention as we can. But what I will say uh, is it's not just one day. It's going to be multiple days. Um, cool. And and the mission of this big phone home is going to be to push for congressional hearings. That's going to be objective number one. Um, so... Am I correct? Sorry, sorry to interrupt you, but am I correct in saying that it's going to happen prior to the 90 day um, yes. additional report or yes. update? Okay. Yeah, it, just like the, the original big phone home, we're going to try and give. But the thing the thing I don't know about that um, report is whether or not it's going to be public or not. Um, we know the report is going to be presented to Congress, but whether or not it's public. If we give them, you know, if we can do a big phone home between now and then, ideally, that would be great. So that way they've got some time to, you know, number one, push for congressional hearings, but number two, also make that report public or at least part of it public, you know, because we want to see what's in that report as well. Um, so, you know, the, the thing I will say is if, uh, if you want to help now, uh, tr help me get the hashtag going again, the big phone home two. Um, and yeah, you know, so that way when, when we do give all the details, cause we're also going to do another website, you know, so I want to make sure all those things, I don't think the website will be done by the time we, we announce the days that we're going to do. Um, but we're just, we're just getting, I mean, literally we just came, we came to this th two or three days ago. So, you know, I want to make sure that i ask the right people everything that you know i did the last time i do this time before i announce anything you know just try to learn from the lessons of the last one and uh but but we're definitely going to have a better website easier that's easier to use um and you know we're talking about some other things but it'll be it's going to be a really really cool all-inclusive totally free event you know, uh, whoever wants to join <clears throat> in the discussion can. Uh, we're going to have room for everyone to talk. Cool. Uh, so it's going to be really, really, really unique, really cool. Um, we're going to have, um, I'm talking to Witness Citizen, you know, uh, to have him on standby Sean, all day. Sean Roush. Yeah. Roush. Uh, Sean Roush. Yeah. Roush. Uh, Roush. Roush. Sean Roush. Uh, and you know so he'll be on he'll be making phone calls all day awesome. while, while we're live um you know that's the idea anyway so you know so still a lot of stuff to plan but those are some of the little sprinkles of details i can give you now um, awesome but, man well it's exciting cool. and uh you are doing great things with your channel man it's exploding congrats on the success of the channel appreciate it man appreciate and thank it. you for doing what you do man because you're you're really pushing the, the conversation in the right direction. I appreciate it, Andrew. Um, you know, would not have done any of this stuff if it wasn't for folks like you. So, you know, we're all part of this. This doesn't belong to me, doesn't belong to anybody. You know, this this topic and this conversation uh, should be open to everyone, <laughs> you know, and everyone. It, we've got room for everyone's opinions and thoughts. Um, so, yeah, man, um, you know, I, we can't wait to have you to be part of it um you know of course preston if you're interested we're gonna have a an email where people can sign up for stuff or uh for either be on the show or help with the show in in, in whatever capacity they want to uh, but i did really what we need is motivated people to make some phone calls cool um you know but hey uh, i appreciate it bro yeah hey let it, let people know how to reach out to you uh keep up to date on what you're doing and, and then yeah. we'll get you out of here um yeah you can just check me out at the unidentified celebrity review uh there's a website youtube is the best way twitter at lou angeles lu angeles um and if you have any questions you can email us at the big phone home at gmail.com right now that might change but but uh but yeah if you got any questions or anything check us out there very cool, Lou. Thank you for stopping by, my friend. Dude, my absolute pleasure, man. I hope you have a, guys uh, have a good fourth, and we'll see you. Uh, we'll see you tomorrow. Yes. Happy Independence Day. Take yes, care, sir. my friend. Peace. All right. Thanks for uh, making room for for Lou. He's doing some really good work uh, with his channel, and I appreciate him stopping by and sharing that. Um, 
So let's reset. Um, we're talking about UFOs, who and WTF is driving them, or who, who <laughs> or what <laughs> is driving them. Uh, we left off talking about the shapes. Um, you answered the question of how do you know for certain that they're not military craft? Uh, you answered that quite succinctly. Um, I think in some cases you don't know because they are reverse engineering this stuff. In other cases, like in your situation, that's fascinating that they actually communicated with you, man, um, and told you what they were. Uh, and that leads us into the big question, the question that I'm here for and the question that I think a lot of people in the chat room are here for. Of the, of the top theories that I came across, I'm going to name what, what they could be. You've already mentioned a few of them. But uh, U.S. military or foreign adversary, time travelers, which is one of my favorites. Maybe not the most accurate, but I think it's cool. <laughs> ultra dimensionals, and I'm going to have to ask you to expound on what that is, ultra dimensionals. Breakaway civilization, which we could talk a little bit more about that and kind of um, explain what that is. Crypto terrestrials which is also another interesting one. And then the, uh, the, the most common, I guess, and the most probably most prevalent is extraterrestrials in various forms, right? If I'm not mistaken, there, there are several different types of extraterrestrials that uh, could be occupying these craft. Is that correct? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's all kinds of theories. <laughs> There is a good portion of the population that believes this is demonic. Seriously. Oh, true. That's true. Um, it could be a spiritual phenomena, um, interdimensional beings, uh, balloons, drones. <laughs> uh, there's all kinds of explanations for UFOs. You know, there was a recent show on uh, Discovery Channel where they were kind of going over the whole disclosure report and they mentioned, well, maybe all UFOs could be explained by some secret inventor some kid who has invented these powerful drones and he's just flying them around. That, that one was definitely an LMAO moment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I agree, man. Uh, That's uh, uh, probably ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, there. I mean, I agree that this is to some extent still a mystery. But on the other hand, I'm not so sure it's a mystery anymore as much as it you know, was like 20, even 30 years ago. I think we've got a pretty good handle on what this probably is, but we can go through it for sure. Okay, cool. So let's start with U.S. tech or foreign adversary. Uh, right. it, it, do you think that the government would know or admit if it was U.S. military or foreign adversary? Uh, what I find interesting about this theory is uh, it's sort of very popular among skeptics. Uh, this is something I think a lot of skeptics will admit, okay, people are saying something, but it's probably secret government stuff. And if you look into it, and I've had a number of people within military say to me that, yes, some of this is military, flat out. You see something flying over Area 51, <laughs> uh, be careful, this could very well be us. Uh, but the problem with the whole, you know, lumping this all in military secret aircraft uh, it doesn't hold water, period, uh, because a lot of these craft are being chased by military jets. A lot of the people who are witnesses are people within the military who know their aircraft and say, no, it's not us. Uh, and ultimately, when these things land and people come out, uh, they don't look like humans. And people who are taken on board these craft are not seeing <laughs> you know, the military, in most cases. There are some cases where people have seen military on board these UFOs. Uh, but by and large, I think it's pretty clear it's not military. And one reason for that would be this has been going on far too long. Another reason is it's far too widespread. There's far, far too many UFOs for this to be military. Another would be is these displays that are put on over large population centers 
Uh, this is absolutely contrary to how the military tests flies their most secret advanced aircraft. They don't chase cars down the road. <laughs> they don't hover over schoolyards. Now, they don't hover over driving movie theaters. They don't, you know, it's just absolutely something they would not do. Uh, so I think there's many, many reasons why we know that most of this isn't military. Most of this is very doubtful, China or Germany or Russia or Japan, uh, because if you look into this, it, it's apparent there's a quite a bit of cooperation within high levels of government on this subject. Uh, these superpowers are all working together, studying this in secret. No, it's not military. It's just not. I think we know this. Once again, Preston, you impress me with your candor. There are almost nobody talking about the potential that this could be Germany or Japan. Everybody's talking about U.S. tech, foreign adversaries, Russia or China, but nobody mentions Germany or Japan. And those are the two countries that have very large uh, annual budgets that could potentially be uh, competing in these areas. And they have developed uh, conventional tech that's f for use in uh, commercial uses like the BMW or, um, you know, the drones. A lot of the drones come, come out of yeah, Japan. Yeah, the drones. This is definitely a new era for UFO <laughs> research because the drones look yeah. like UFOs. Yeah. You see them all over the Internet, particularly at night. They can put on a display that is like, wow, what is that? Yeah. Yeah, drones are uh, very confusing, very disruptive to the research of UFOs. But uh, I think if you know what you're looking for, you can spot a drone versus a, a UFO, a true unidentified. So the next uh, is time travelers. Uh, and this is one I like a lot because I think – it's the, the hypothesis is that there's something happening in the future that started in the present or some time ago, and they're coming back here to fix that problem so that their future is not wiped out. Um, how do you feel or what are your thoughts on, on that hypothesis? Um, it's one of the top five I, I like to entertain. I think it's got some I mean, there are cases you can march out that will support this theory, because uh, what I like about it is whoever's piloting these things do have the ability of manipulating time in ways that we don't understand, and in a lot of different ways. And it's not just like missing time, right? People have a sighting and boom, it's an hour later. Something's going on there. <laughs> I'm not sure it's necessarily manipulation of time. But we do know of cases where people will have an experience, they're taken on board a craft, and they're put back uh, at the scene at the same, you know, a minute later. But their encounter was hours, days, weeks long. Uh, so there's a weird time manipulation there where they're pulled out of our time stream, perhaps. A lot of cases also where people are seeing a UFO and suddenly no one around them is moving. All their friends, their family is, are paralyzed, frozen. And it's not just a case of you know paralysis. The birds are still in the sky. Leaves are not moving. Waves are not moving. So it's as if time has stopped. And I've thought about this a lot. I'm like, well, you, can you really even stop time? Because are you stop, stopping time in a, that location? And what about the location right next to it? <laughs> I mean, what would that look like? Or you can't stop time in the entire universe. That's absolutely just unfathomable. So I think what's happening here is they're pulling people out of the time stream. But, okay. Or something along those. I don't know. It's very hard to understand. But there's this, they can telescope time. They can compress time. And there are cases where people have been taken into a UFO and shown the future. I'm um, taken to past events, seriously. 
And if you have a machine, a technology that can essentially exceed the speed of light, uh, that does open up time travel possibilities. Uh, because we know mathematically rate times time equals distance. And if distance becomes a non-issue, well, yeah, you can travel back in time. Or in, in, the ETs are predicting the future accurately in a lot of cases. So this, and some people have been told that we are you from the future. It's a very small residue of cases. It's not a lot. I don't think this explains the grays. I don't think they're time travelers from our future. Uh, but we can't completely rule out that some might be. Um, my theory kind of regarding the time travel theory is that does the fact that someone can do time tra travel preclude them from being extraterrestrial? And I'm gonna put a big fat no there uh, because if you have that technology, you can time travel. That does not mean you don't live on another planet and are a biological being that is not human. Fair. So I'm going to leave it on the table as a possibility for some of them, but I think it's pretty clear that you can't explain all of these as time travelers. I agree. And uh, I'm glad that you are, are not eliminating that uh, because I like it. Um, I don't think I agree with you that I don't think it, it covers all of the bases. Um, but it does check a lot of the boxes. So I think time travelers is one of the possible scenarios. Yep. Ultra dimensionals. Uh, now this is one I, I'm still having a little bit of trouble wrapping my head around. Ultra dimensional is, does this, does this, is this the same thing as the multi universe theory or is there something with other dimensions that I, I um, is different than, than a different universe. Yeah, and I think this is the problem with that theory is it's not really well defined and it, and we're mixing theories here. I mean, ultra dimensional crypto terrestrials, uh, probable universes, um, all of these kind of are hard to define. But I think what probably the second most popular theory to explain UFOs is that they're not extraterrestrial at all. It's some sort of interdimensional intelligence. I think Jacques Vallée, John Keel, Lauren Coleman, Jerome Clark, uh, a number of researchers have raised this possibility because there are some very bizarre and symbolic aspects to UFO encounters, which kind of defy the extraterrestrial explanation. Like, is this tracking cultures? Does a person's belief system play a role in what they experience? Is there a matrix-like aspect to UFO encounters? Um, is it kind of like a weird biofeedback system that is showing us what we expect to see? Is this something that's masquerading as extraterrestrial? And there, Jacques Vallée is very well educated in this phenomena and has raised this possibility that this is not extraterrestrial at all. It's ultra it's something else, it's interdimensional. My problem with this theory is it's vague, it's very hard to define, it's anthropocentric, meaning, okay, a UFO is here for us, about us, really, we're the center of this whole phenomena, um, and it's here to influence us and our belief system, and it's very anthropocentric. And if you go throughout history, anthropocentric theories um, often get disproved eventually. I mean, we learned we're not the center. We don't, Earth does not, the sun does not revolve around our Earth. Uh, I am just not so sure about this theory because it's a very wide universe. Um, I think it's the extraterrestrial theories, I think is very logical, but I am intrigued by these weird symbolic aspects to UFO encounters. Uh, and it is clear that ETs can sort of put on disguises and screen memories or whoever, the, I should put the intelligence behind this phenomenon, uh, can do this. So this is probably my second favorite theory, uh, that there, this might not always be extraterrestrial. This might be something that is like a djinn, 
you know, like a, a spiritual intelligence that is pretending to be extraterrestrial, but might not be. There are some good cases that like, wow, this just doesn't really sound like what ETs would do. People have gone on board UFOs and there's, there's been carpet. <laughs> you know, there's been stuff that they see Jesus on board a UFO. Uh, they see things that you just, hmm, is this really extraterrestrial? Uh, it makes you scratch your head. And it's like, is there something going on here? Uh, that could be something we don't even fully understand. Uh, so I cannot completely rule it out. It's, yeah, my second favorite theory. It's not my favorite, though. <laughs> and there's, I think, some major, major problems with it. We'll get to the your favorite theory. Um, <laughs> but right there, I just want to say, ladies and gentlemen, Preston Dennett dropping some big brain concepts right there. Um, I, I was keeping up with you, but I had to leave the chat alone so that I could follow you because <laughs> that stuff was deep uh, and fascinating. And thank you for, for laying that out in such a nice, articulate way, man. That was beautiful. Um, so the the next – and you, you said interdimensional. I said ultra-dimensional. Are they the same thing or is it is – it, again, it's hard to define, right? So let's just leave yeah. it at that, okay? Yeah. I think you can even lump the demonic theory in there. True. Which, you know, you can't completely rule out. Uh, I think I pretty much have – and we'll just, I mean, if I can cover this theory, because I have looked at all of these theories. Yeah. Because some people seriously believe this. Um, and generally speaking, these are people who are fundamentally religious and have looked into it. And uh, th there are, you know, statements in the Bible that point towards this theory. I'm like, okay, let's look into the demonic theory. Because I've done a lot of ghost research. I've been to haunted houses. And it's clear that some of these hauntings are not conventional spirits. They're not your deceased grandma. <laughs> these are dark, evil spirits, which are bent on human destruction, bent on confusing you. They will often target a single person. This is a haunting that follows a very set pattern, starting with knocks on the walls and cold spots and bad odors, usually targeting a child in the house or a sick person or someone with perhaps mental problems, someone who messed around with the Ouija board. Uh, but I don't see any good, powerful evidence that says that the, the phenomena is demonic. The closest I would get is would say that perhaps some people do have negative experiences and they're, they're dealing with entities who are following an evil agenda. Uh, I think that's a very small, small minority of cases, almost statistically insignificant, honestly, uh, meaning it's, you know, l less than 10%. Uh, although, but, although saying it's insignificant is not really fair because it's not insignificant to those people who <laughs> actually experience that, right? <laughs> right. It sure isn't. Yeah. And my heart goes out to them. And I, I have talked to people, you know, I put these cases in my books. I'm trying very hard to be objective. There's a tendency in this field by a lot of researchers to pick a theory and do all the cherry picking and shoe fitting and march these cases out that support your theory. That's not good science. Right. Good, a good scientist takes all of the evidence and lays it out without overlaying it with your rose colored glasses, without you know your theories as to what you think it is. The theories come after the evidence, not first. Uh, and that's a that's problem a in point. this field. Good point. So, so uh, absolutely, there is some very weird aspects to it. And uh, but looking into the whole field of demonology, I am not convinced. I don't find the evidence persuasive that this explains the UFO phenomena. The demons that want to hurt people, destroy them, their ultimate goal is destruction. And we're not seeing that with most of this phenomena. People are coming away spiritually transformed for the better. Are coming away from an encounter healed. They are not in their bed, <laughs> entranced. They are gone. We don't know where they are when they're reporting being on board one of these craft, uh, which, you know, I am not sure the, a spirit has the ability to 
disappear a person. We don't hear that right. in these types of cases. So that's an interesting theory, but it falls short of explaining the evidence. It doesn't explain implant cases. It does it's not a... explain the landing trace cases. Right. It doesn't explain a lot of the evidence. And that's where I think we have to follow the evidence. So the demonic theory, do demons are real. Are they UFOs? Most likely not. The evidence right. points to them, probably not. So equating one with the other, probably a mistake. Um, I love that. And the, the way you laid that out again, perfect, man, beautiful. I had not even thought of the demonic theory, but uh, that's why you're here and yeah, you're dropping, dropping the knowledge bombs, man. It's important to discuss. Yeah. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, we, let's talk about this in a logical friendly way. People are very set on their beliefs. And a lot of beliefs are faith-based and not evidence-based. True. What, what, you know, skeptics, by and large, have not examined the evidence. They, I know, I was a skeptic. I had my own preconceived notions about what this was. And, uh, you know, discussing this with someone who's convinced it's demonic is very difficult because they are married to that theory. And I'm not going to, you know, lock myself into any one theory until I know, no, no, for sure what this is. I just want to say a huge thank you to the chat room for being patient with me, guys. I have not looked at the chat because what Preston is saying is all new information to me. It's absolutely, uh, what's the word, captivating. <laughs> okay, I, um, I'm learning from everything that he's telling me. So I haven't really looked at the chat. I will get back to you. A couple new people I see. Amy Hall, Christopher Plain. Thanks for being here, brother. Uh, Jack Ryan, good to see you again, man. Jack Hetfield, um, great to see everybody in here. Uh, that's just a, a few of you guys. Um, and I will try to get to your questions. We still got a little bit over an hour or a little bit under an hour left. Um, we may ask Preston to stay a little bit longer, but it is 4th of July. He may have big plans. Uh, so no, no, no plans. <laughs> no. Uh, maybe we'll get to your questions, guys. Uh, but thanks for being here. And um, we still got a long way to go. So the, the next theory that I uncovered in the research was breakaway civilization. And I think that is a really interesting theory. Um, Probably not my favorite, but there are some really strong arguments in favor of this one. Uh, do you do you want to break it down, Preston? Yeah, yeah, I like that term. It's very intriguing, breakaway civilization, and I think that there are, is some interesting aspects to this. One would be that perhaps you know the Nazis are flying this stuff around. You know, they broke away and you know secretly moved off to Antarctica and. I haven't really focused my own research on this, so it's, I can't speak with true authority on it. I haven't, I don't have any first time cases that would support that theory at all, but there are researchers who are looking into this possibility because we know Germany did, was one, among the first to really obtain this technology. True. Uh, so I had someone tell me, oh, the UFOs that buzzed the Capitol in 1954, those were the Nazis. I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. You know, I never even considered the possibility of a breakaway civilization at that point. So I don't know that that's true. <laughs> I have no evidence to say that. Um, so I can't really speak to like, are the Nazis flying around these sauces? But hmm, what I can say is that there are a number, I mean, we have had civilizations in Earth's distant past. And by that, I will call, talk Lemuria or Atlantis or, you know, going even farther back, there have probably been a series of advanced civilizations. Look at the Vinyanas of ancient Egypt. Uh, uh, I, th it, I thought the Viman, Vimana was uh, from India. Or or India. India. Did, did I say Egypt? Yeah. Um, I meant India. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Uh, yeah, India. Uh, so uh, that raises some questions. And like the Pleiadians, uh, there, there's a number of people who claim to have met 
what we call Pleiadians. And uh, they have said in some of these contact cases that they used to live on Earth and left. Mm -hmm. And now they're coming back because we, they are related to us and we are related to them. And that would be, I think, what would, we would term a breakaway civilization, although it's you know, an ancient civilization or prehistory is pre-modern history. Right. Uh, so yeah, I'm intrigued by that. Uh, and perhaps there are some, you know, inventors in modern society, you know, in the 1900s who invented this stuff. Uh, you may, you may remember the airship wave of the 1890s, 1900s. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Um, and that was really strange because these were Zeppelin-like objects, uh, which were flying low over, you know, California. There was a number of cases in San Francisco. It spread across the U.S., all across the world, really. And uh, these look like they might be modern day inventors. Uh, and you have to wonder if some of these guys didn't continue in secret and still are, and are flying this craft around. And they are essentially human. They are us. They are what we would term a breakaway, maybe not a civilization, but a group. Uh, so huh, yeah, this is another very interesting theory but so hard to pin down and prove because um, how would you prove that? I mean, how, how could you possibly prove that the UFOs we are seeing are, you know, Joe Smith from the 1900s and his family and you know, a group of people who got together and um, eh, some of the ETs are human. They look human. They look right, right. like us. That raises a lot of questions. True. Sure. Um, and, I, and I'm using that term ET again. <laughs> we'll uh, get to that, man. Well, I know you're chomping at the bit to get a. We got we got one more uh, to talk about. And actually, I, the the next theory that I uncovered was crypto terrestrials, and that theory kind of goes along the lines of what you were already talking about with the breakaway civilization, where these crypto terrestrials are from Earth. They've lived here longer than humans have but they're different. They're a different species than humans. And yeah. they just have advanced tech beyond our understanding. Um, and they're hidden to us because our technology has not been able to, up to this point, has not been able to really track and uh, monitor what they're doing. Um, so what, what's your thought on the crypto terrestrials? Is it different than a breakaway civilization type of scenario? Yeah, I think this theory would be that we're not the first here. Like, look at the reptilians. Uh, perhaps there are, they are intelligent dinosaurs who survived the catastrophe that killed the dinosaurs right. by, by going underground. That's right. And this is, they are earthlings then. The reptilians would technically be earthlings. Right. Um, so yeah, the earthling theory. <laughs> is be another way of putting this. Uh, I don't think grays evolved here and are still living here uh, because so many people talk about where they possibly come from. Uh, but ugh, what about the Lemurians, you know, under Mount Shasta? They may have been one of these civilizations that are still there and have been here for millennia. Perhaps we are sharing this planet with people who live here and have lived here. The short little blue beings I've, uh, that some people describe. Uh, I've talked to a few people who've seen them. They're like little squat faced dwarf like beings. Oh, like, uh, are, are, um, are you um, talking about gnomes? Yeah, like gnomes? Sort of, like no, the, okay. the whole, the whole, you know, fairy phenomena of, of Ireland and yes. England exactly. is really, I kind of just laughed that off until I've looked into the evidence. I'm like, oh God, I don't really want to look into this. But started reading the literature and I'm like, oh God, you know, this yeah. is pretty compelling stuff. There are multiple witness cases. There's a wide variety of non-human beings, kobolds, gnomes, leprechauns, <laughs> fairies. I'm just, and you look into it and you're like, hmm. Well, would Bigfoot um, fall into that as well? Would Bigfoot be yeah. a crypto terrestrial? Yeah, I don't think we have good evidence that uh, Bigfoot is what we would term technologically advanced. 
Uh, but that doesn't mean they're not spiritually advanced and highly, highly intelligent, as intelligent as humans, or even more so. There are, is some good evidence to say that they are very intelligent yeah. and super talented in terms of psychic abilities, being able to turn invisible, uh, communicate telepathically, relate complicated concepts. Uh, there is an ET connection with the whole Bigfoot Sasquatch phenomena that's hands down for real. There are a hundred cases at least where these guys are seen at the same time or together, in the two phenomena intersecting perfectly. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there is something to this whole crypto terrestrial theory. Uh, Cause what about all these bases that, that were, you know, underwater bases, underground bases? Bases on the moon. How long have these bases been here? We don't know. It could be a lot longer than modern humanity, which we trace back to 40,000 years. Well, it start, they keep edging it back, back more and more, the mainstream anthropo anthropologists. Uh, it's clear we don't know how humans evolved on this planet. Uh, the, the theory is, of course, evolution. We came from you know, primates, mm -hmm. uh, but there's a lot of missing links. There's a lot of artifacts that are being discovered that point towards ancient civilizations. So I'm wondering if some of these ancient civilizations never left or if they did leave, they're coming back. Uh, so there, yeah, this is a lot stranger world. And I think we're, we've, are being taught in college and schools, but, uh, so. Um, that's another great theory, the whole crypto terrestrial theory. Well, uh, again, I love the way you break it down, man. I feel like a kindergartner, and you're my favorite kindergarten teacher. Right? <laughs> so uh, because you explain it so clearly and so uh, rudimentary um, that it's just easy to understand it. Uh, so... Unless there's another hypothesis or theory out there that you want to talk about before we get to your number one favorite, um, just jump into it. Uh, go for it. Your your number one theory is the 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 number eight theory on my list, but I, I want to leave it for the last because I knew it was your favorite. Yeah, well, we discussed time travelers. That's intriguing, but I don't think we have good enough evidence to say for sure one way or the other. The uh, ultra terrestrials, the you know, the interdimensionals. That one is really intriguing because there are some very symbolic aspects. But even then, we don't know how ETs think. They can perhaps put on shows to influence people, to teach people. They will dress up their UFOs as a living room <laughs> to make a person feel comfortable. And just because someone has sees carpet or a couch and a TV on board a UFO doesn't mean that this is a near-death experience, you know, or something that's wholly symbolic and produced from a person's mind. If ETs are that telepathic, they might do this for our own comfort. Uh, breakaway civilizations, yeah, mm, that's, an, that's a head scratcher for sure. Uh, but ultimately, I think we've got to follow. How do you explain the landing trace cases? How do you explain these implants that are in people's bodies? How do you explain the radar return cases? How do you explain, you know, people who've been struck by a beam of light and are suffering from radiation illness? Um, something that they the not, healing the healing yeah. properties yeah. that you, you mentioned earlier. Right. Uh, and where they, is a person when they are quote abducted, taken on board? They're not the, in their bed. The, they are the knowledge. Missing knowledge downloads that people receive from this from this phenomenon right so I, so what 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 theory does explain all that or uh, fits right. fits into that square uh what fits into that round hole the best yeah the theory which by far is most popular i'm going to say nine out of ten experiencers that i've talked to believe this and they are the ones who experienced it I think the theory that best fits the evidence as a whole is the most popular theory. People 
people from other worlds, people like <laughs> us. Man, you had me. You, when you said people, I thought you meant humans. I was like, wait a minute, Preston. <laughs> right. Okay. So people from other worlds, extraterrestrials. Because yeah. look at us. We know what we are, right? I mean, we kind of do because we are who we are. We know, we know, we think, therefore I am. We know that we're biological beings. I mean, we've got body odor. <laughs> you know, we have to go to the bathroom. We have to eat. Uh, we live, we you know we're born, we die. We know a lot about humans. We know a lot about just human research is still one of the big mysteries. Who are we? What is the human body? Where did we come from? Where are we going? There are still a lot of mysteries surrounding just humans as beings, uh, but we're pretty sure we live on earth on a planet revolving around a sun and that there are other suns out there. And not only other suns, but a billion, billion, billion of them. <laughs> I mean, an endless amount. And we now know this. We know this hands down from the Hubble telescope and you know, probes we've sent out to other planets. We've been to other planets. We've looked back on Earth. We know what a planet is. So it's a very, very logical, almost inescapable conclusion that there has to be other people out there like us. It's almost inescapable. I'm going to say that most mainstream scientists accept the fact or the probability, the possibility that there's extraterrestrial life out in the universe. Maybe it's not visiting our planet, but I think pretty much all mainstream scientists, I won't say all, but most, believe that extraterrestrial life is a possibility, if not a probability, just given the size of the universe. The extraterrestrial theory is so darn logical. It's almost, because if it's not extraterrestrial, what are we? What are we? Um, the only other theory would be like, we are the center of the universe and that everything we see is a matrix. It's all about us. No, it's everything we see is just a projection of our own thoughts. And that's very self-centered. Uh, but that's the second most popular theory, basically, is what it comes down to, is that we're living in a matrix. Mm. And there's a, a, maybe another intelligence out there that is ma manipulating us. But the extraterrestrial theory is the one that explains radar return cases. It explains the landing trace cases. It explains these objects that are being pulled out of people's bodies and studied. It explains the animal effect cases. It explains every piece of evidence we got. Even the weird symbolic aspects of this can be explained as extraterrestrial. I think it's the theory which hands down best fits the facts. Angels, that's another theory we didn't really talk about. Uh, but I will tell you that I've talked to experiencers who've been told flat out by the ETs that what you thought was angels was us. Mm. And if you look at the biblical accounts of angels, they come down and say, do not be afraid. <laughs> we mean you no harm. Same phrase that the ETs say. Uh, and they, there's a lot of aspects to angelic encounters that match up perfectly with uh, ET encounters. Then again, there's some cases that are modern day involving angels, which seem to be angels in the classic sense. So I am, don't want to conflate all these phenomenons together. Um, I think angels are probably angels. Demons are probably demons. When someone has a near death experience, they're drawn into a tunnel of light and healed. Yeah, there's a lot of commonalities to a UFO experience, but I don't think it's a UFO experience. I think aliens, extraterrestrials, people from other planets best fits the evidence. And we absolutely know for sure once we get our hand on those craft, on those yeah. bodies. That's why I'm so mad at this government disclosure process. Like, oh, we need to study this a little more. Like, wait a second, haven't you already spent billions of our defense budget on this? Don't you have UFOs secreted at Norton Air Force Base? Edwards, Wright-Patterson is neck deep in this, <laughs> Area 51, probably a lot of these Air Force bases across the U.S. and the world have the hardware. Uh, so 
extraterrestrial theory is so hands down hard to walk away from that I think we're at the point now where we can say, you know what? Mystery solved. It's not a mystery. We know what it is. They no know. question. No question in your mind. Uh, you're absolutely convinced that this is the reality of the situation. And uh, I, again, I respect you for that, for for having the courage to come out and say that openly, not worrying about the ridicule, the pushback, the naysayers. No. You're, you're not worried about those people because you know in your heart you know that this is a truth well i pers i know from personal experience right that i'm probably but but and a- back it up with research and evidence yeah. from from years of exp- uh, years of yeah. studying the topic too my problem is i cannot prove it i cannot prove it conclusively yeah. i don't have the alien implant in my hands that i can show to people you know i don't have a hard evidence, but I think if you, a person is willing to research the evidence. The landing trace cases are very convincing. Sure. I mean, look at what happened to Lonnie Zamora. Study that landing trace case. It's very hard to explain anything other than extraterrestrial. I think the implant evidence is very hard to explain. The onboard UFO accounts, the contactee cases, when someone is face to face with a being that does not look human. Are you really telling me that it's not an alien? Really? Yeah. I mean, it looks like a duck, it walks like a duck. I mean, it's a, Occam's razor, you know that theory, the simplest yeah. explanation is probably the, the, the true. Right. Um, it's so, so hard to walk away from the extraterrestrial theory. It's been the number one theory from the beginning and there has been no strong evidence that I would say it deviates from it, except for perhaps that second theory where some UFO encounters get exceedingly, exceedingly bizarre and strange. Mm-hmm. You're like, hmm, <laughs> why would so, ETs do that? Well, let's take the extraterrestrial hypothesis, just to uh, break it down a little bit further, since it's, it's your favorite, um, it's been around the longest. There are a number of types of extraterrestrials that have been uh so identified i guess you could use the term um there are grays there are mantids there are insectoids reptilian humanoid and there's probably a dozen others that i didn't even think about robotic robotic okay a lot of those (laughs) um which one of those or, or do you want to break that down? Are, are mantids and insectoids, are they two different uh, species? Or are they the greys putting on a mask? Uh, I, I don't think so. Okay. Because what we do have is probably hundreds of thousands of reports of people who have seen humanoids. And this is an important point because what people are seeing is humanoids. They have arms, they have legs. They may look like a praying mantis. (laughs) They may look like an ant. They may look like, you know, an insectoid or a human looking, but they are humanoid by and large, almost always. We don't get like octopus aliens or spider aliens with eight legs. They're just not there. So this is a strange sort of piece of evidence that we're stuck with. Humanoid is the form people are seeing. And what I find very interesting is we have people who are never read a UFO book in their life uh, who describe greys. And this is very early on, the Tahunga Canyon contacts by Ann Druffel and uh, D. Scott Rogo. They were describing greys at the same time that Sergeant Charles Moody was describing greys. You know, and all these people who are widely separated geographically uh, are seeing the same form. So, hmm, what are we to make of that? I think a gray is what it appears to be. It's not in disguise. They can put on disguises. They can dress up as clowns. 
as superheroes, as teddy bears, as Barbie dolls. They do this for kids all the time when they come and you know, visit them in their bedrooms. And less so for adults, but we'll put on wigs, put on hats, put on a pinstripe suit. Five cases of this that I know of personally <laughs> happened to Whitley Strieber. E.T., the Greys came wearing a suit. <laughs> Uh, freaked him out. Why would they do that? Uh, reduce the fear factor. Another lady that came wearing cowboy hats. She's a, you know, a horsewoman. She raises horses. Uh, so they can put on clothes and disguises. Uh, but I remember when my sister-in-law started describing Grays. I knew for a fact she'd never read a UFO book. <laughs> mm. you know, I know this, and there wasn't anything on TV at that time, really. Uh, there were no UFO shows except for In Search Of. And the idea of Grays wasn't really presented on that show. As I recall, it may have been, but uh, she wasn't a fan of that show. And she's describing these Grays. I'm just, chills are going up and down my spine. It's, as I'm like, oh my gosh, if she says it's a jumpsuit, I'm going to you know, <laughs> prop my pants. And then she says, it was a green jumpsuit, I'm like, oh my God, big dark eyes, I'm gonna go pale white skin, I'm just, just going down the list. So this is how we know that greys are real because there's so much independent corroboration from witnesses who don't know each other describing exactly the same thing. And the, uh, the greys, in your opinion, are they different from the other types of, or supposedly the species? Uh, uh, the mantids, the insectoids, the yeah. humanoids, yeah. the reptilians. And I would say that because we've got a good number of cases where people are taken on board a craft and they see greys. They see they're short little ones, three foot tall, very robotic, very unemotional, um, sometimes shut off and just stacked like cordwood. Uh, people have seen this. Wow. Those could be not quite alive as we would think of it androids okay. um, then you have sh short little grays you know four to five feet tall uh who have varying temp temperaments right some are not super emotional very clinical very scientific uh, but some are very loving very emotionally advanced you have tall grays you have a wide variety of grays but you have people who are seeing grays praying mantis and human looking ETs on the same craft working together. Travis Walton described seeing human looking ETs and greys on the same craft. So what's going on here? Um, why would some greys dress themselves up as humans? You know, and mantids are again, very commonly described over and over again by people who don't know each other. So I think we are dealing with separate species here uh, but then again, there's, look at the biological diversity of humans. You know, look at the Watusis in Africa who are seven feet tall, you know, six, seven feet tall, slender, dark skinned. And look at the pygmies, very, very short. Look at, we've got Caucasians, we've got Asian, we've got, we got people of all different races who have widely varying appearances, who, you know, you come to another culture, they look like an alien if you've never seen them before. <laughs> We've got a, a culture now that's very much a, in the information age. We all know what other people all across Earth look like. But back in, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years ago, uh, these cultures were widely separated. And this is why we have a lot of, I think, uh, strife, I guess, or uh, difficulties communicating and understanding different cultures uh, because we are different. Yeah. And I think we're seeing that probably with greys. So when people describe greys that like, well, they weren't gray. Mine were kind of pinkish skin or mine were tan. Mine had a kind of yellowish complexions. Mine were bluish. There's green, little green men. There are. Um, so I'm not entirely convinced that these aren't all the same species as we would think of it. And I think genetics is probably universal on other planets. 
genetics and you know the mitochondria DNA, it's probably what's we're gonna find when we examine these extraterrestrials. Uh, so yeah, a wide variety of beings, but some are probably more closely related than we think. So, um, shoot, man, I had a, about 10 questions. I did not want to interrupt you. And then I, I was listening to you and I forgot all of them. So what I'm going to do, oh, I, I was, uh, I was, I kept saying humanoid as a type of uh, ET, but I actually meant human looking. Um, and you correct me on that a couple times, but I, I want to be clear. When I was talking about humanoid, I was talking about the human looking extraterrestrials because yeah. they're all they're all basically humanoid um, yeah. I, I have four or five main categories grays mantis human looking and what i call strange humanoids because they're almost human looking but they're eight feet tall with yeah. giant eyes and a chin and a giant ears or i mean they're clearly not human and i don't like the term nordic i don't like it at all it's misleading uh because it it's a little bit, I'll just say it, racist. Yeah. Uh, because the human looking come in all colors. I interviewed a gentleman, Stan Hughes, who had an encounter with the sphere that landed in front of him and outstepped this human looking person. And he said he was the most handsome man he's ever seen, but he looked Middle Eastern, had dark skin, dark hair, dark eyes. Talked to another guy who saw human looking ETs in Malibu. And I'm like, what did they look like? He said, well, they were all about five foot tall. They looked largely identical, almost like twins, which is something we hear. Yes. And uh, he said they were dark hair, dark eyes, looked kind of Mesoamerican, Peruvian maybe, Mexican, Latin, Latin <laughs> is basically what it came down to. Uh, so yeah, you do get like blonde hair, blue eyed, muscular, but you also get the same Dark skinned, you know, light skinned, tan, the whole variation we see here on Earth of human looking ETs. So that's kind of the term I prefer would be human looking, not Nordic, which is, you know, Caucasian. Right. Blonde hair, blue eyes, tall. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going, I'm, I, I, I want to shift gears. I'm going to get to the chat room. We might have to go over to get to the chat room because there's a ton of questions going on there. I mean, I'm looking at uh, the numbers here and there's over a hundred uh, messages in the chat room that I haven't even looked at. Um, but it's a fascinating conversation. I want to give you all the time you need to, to illustrate or to articulate your thoughts. But this, this next um, section of the conversation I want to turn to is How can we, as a population, now, how can we prepare for what's coming next? And the reason I'm asking this is because it has been speculated that the reason the government is coming out with the information uh, and they're being open with the disclosure, they're being more transparent, is because their hand is being forced. And they may not have a choice at some point in the very near future that this reality is going to be upon us the ets are going to be here they're going to be in, interacting with us as as often and as frequent as we interact with one another so it's going to be a part of everyday life so what are the steps that people can take to prepare for this because First of all, is it, is it going to catch a lot of people unaware? And are people going to freak out and panic when the, the truth of it does come out? But yeah. to, to avoid that from happening, what are the steps that should, should take place? Um, I think people should first educate themselves. You know, throw out your beliefs that are not supported by evidence. Look at what this phenomena really is objectively. Um, try to remove yourself from fear-based thinking. We've been really trained to fear. Uh, and I think people need to realize that the universe is a safe place. Uh, I don't think the universe is a hostile 
place that's trying to kill you. No, it's supporting you. It's where you come from. It's, you are an integral part of this universe. Uh, and we have to, have to, have to, and this is the number one message from the ETs, is become aware of who we are and what we can do. They are trying so hard to wake us up to our own abilities of telepathy, of precognition, of astral travel, of past life recall, of healing. We need to start using our own awareness and our intuition. This is huge because we are in a, a state right now where people cannot communicate with each other. We don't even know if people are lying because how can you tell, you know, if you can't read their mind? If we can get to a point where we can communicate telepathically, that would change the entire world. And telepathy is a real thing. It's been proven in a laboratory setting. Most people have experienced some form of it. Like, oh, you know, I was just thinking about you and you called, you know, or, or this, thought of this and it just happened, or I had a dream and it came true. Um, these are real things. This is a very important part of being human. And this, I think, would be our best way to really prepare is to become grounded in your thinking and really try to do some self work, meditate, remove yourself from this fear-based thinking, become more self-sufficient. Don't rely on idiots for answers. If you think the government is gonna tell you the truth, look at their history. Have they ever been truthful on this subject ever? Not really. So why would you look to them for disclosure? Uh, I'm just not, convinced that they're ever going to tell us the truth on this subject. Uh, they might have to, because I think one of the driving forces behind disclosure is the ETs themselves saying, if you don't do it, we will come down and land and show them ourselves to all humanity. And you will no longer be able to enslave the human race with your greed, corruption, and evil ways. So I think the best thing we can do is to become self-aware, autonomous, independent in our thinking, log, you know, analytically think this through, meditate, become psychically aware. Uh, this is really important stuff. Uh, we have to sort of wean ourselves off of this negative fear-based thinking, which is so prevalent in society. The TV is like a fear box. <laughs> it, it's just, we have to be really careful on how we approach this phenomena. The government, secret government, is controlling our perception of this phenomena. I think they know these are ETs. I think they know that the ETs are not here to kill people and hurt humanity and take over and eat us for lunch. I think they know this. Uh, ETs have been around forever, for millennia. But from a military perspective, from their point, it's hostile to them because these ETs are coming down and shutting down our nuclear missiles. So we, you know, the secret government, the military cannot destroy other people. They're trying to stop the hostility. So from a military perspective, I can see why they're concerned. Because uh, they're hovering over our power stations, our dams, our mines, our air force bases. They're shutting down our missiles. They're, they're doing like all kinds of things that's got to make them really uncomfortable. <laughs> uh, but I think ultimately they know for sure that this is not hostile to humanity. And that's why we're pu they're pushing the alien threat scenario. And if you really think aliens are a threat, look at the evidence. What happens when a person is taken on board a craft? Seriously, look at it. Yes, it can be very scary if you're pulled on board and you're like, didn't ask for this. And you're like, oh my God, look at this gray. It's poking me with a needle. Stop, don't probe me. Ah, you know, this can be uncomfortable to say the least. But people who don't have a strong fear reaction are not treated in any sort of hostile way. Over and over again, people are given messages 
over and over again, people are shown the engine room, taken to the, the helm, the control room. They are given all kinds of spiritual advice. There are many, many reasons to think that this is good news for humanity, and not so many to think that, well, they are here to hurt us. So we need to really start to think and look at this objectively and stop being so fear-based. So the, uh, I, I agree with you. Um, and the fear, the, uh, the hatred, I, I always say this, we attack what we hate, we hate what we fear, and we fear what we don't know or don't understand. For the people that are um, going to be blindsided by this topic, it's better to accept it as reality, educate yourself, and get comfortable with the idea that things are changing. Change is inevitable. And if you're not prepared for it, it's going to disrupt your life. Uh, accept change. Stop fearing the unknown. You know, and if you're, you're afraid of the unknown, then educate yourself. Uh, somebody in the chat mentioned something about that. Uh, people seem to think that because they have a bit of education, they have all the answers about what's real and what's true. Uh, this is by Rose. Thank you for your comment, Rose. A little learning is a dangerous thing. It's also, it's, it's also a thing that could save a lot of pain and suffering in the future if people are educated and and have better understanding of the the world that we live in just the understanding that it, this world is far stranger and more interesting than we can even imagine so start thinking outside that box get outside of those daily routines and do a little bit of deep thinking about the possibility of life from other planets coming to, to uh, occupy or to coexist with us on this planet. And you're not going to be blindsided. You're not going to be freaked out when that happens. Yeah. Yeah. The more you educate yourself, the more questions it raises. Uh, it does. And uh, looking at the chat and some of the negative comments, I always find those kind of flattering because <laughs> I'm like, all right, because you know, if you're pressing buttons, this is important enough that it's, you know, making people react in a way that they're trying to counter it. Uh, that's good news. That means people are getting the message and that the efforts are being taken to sort of stop that, uh, which means you are having an effect. Uh, so I am encouraged that people are questioning things. And th this whole phenomenon is very much a core belief. It really hits you and your core, like, it's like religion and politics. It is a hot button issue for sure. Uh, and so people can be very, very emotional about it and do a lot of emotion based thinking and come quite awesome, uh, which is, you know, I mean, everyone's entitled to their opinion, of course. But I think what we need to do is come together. Remember, we are all one. We all live in this universe together. Um, what one person does affects everyone else. If we were to take our defense budget, our multi-billion dollar defense budget, and just give it away to our enemies and say, what do you want? We'll buy you anything. You know, what, what if everyone started sharing? Uh, it would be amazing how quickly all our problems would disappear. Uh, because instead we have this divisive attitude like, Oh, you're different. You know, you're going to hurt me. No. Once you get to know a person, I think they will give you the shirt off their back. And that's what we need to do is start really coming together and getting to know each other and, and working through our differences friendly in a friendly way. Um, if you are absolutely convinced this is an evil phenomena, okay, let's talk about it. You know, I am not here to preach and change your belief system. I'm here to come together and let's solve this mystery. Let's figure out what's going on. Let's find a way to work together and we can move forward much more quickly. Uh, but someone who's like just throwing sand in the gears, 
what are you doing? Are you really thinking this through? Is that really the best course for you? Uh, I think it becomes clearer and clearer that there are people who are purposefully negative and debunkers who are, I don't know if they're paid by the government or what, or if they're just good off on make, being difficult. Uh, but this definitely is a hot button, button issue for people. And I think there's fear of it because it will change, it, it shatters people's world's view and that's difficult. Yeah. Yeah. I know it. I was not happy when I found out UFOs are real. Right. I thought, oh, they're torturing people. <gasps> this is terrible. This is terrible news for humanity. I kind of bought into a lot of the disinformation uh, that was going on because it was very cleverly put together until I found out that, wow, an enormous amount of money is being spent to make UFO witnesses look like idiots. That's not a coincidence that there's a ridicule factor. This was a policy officially adopted by our own government. Your tax dollars at work. <laughs> it's important to be aware of that, that our beliefs about this phenomena have been very carefully shaped for decades. Agreed. What's that clicking noise going on over there? Do you hear a clicking noise? I'm coming from your end. Uh, that may have been me clicking my pen. I'll just... <laughs> oh, oh, okay. <laughs> it was it was kind of weird. Uh, um, <laughs> I, I'm just going to um, post one more comment from Rose because it's a it's a good way to end this program. And because we've been at it two hours, I uh, looked through the chat. There was really nothing that was um, there. There was no really questions it was a lot of comments um and some of it had to do a lot with what we talked about over uh, you know the first hour so uh rose says you're right education is the antidote to fear in this area there are so many things i had assumed that i realized now were wrong a lot of stuff from the church is just ridiculous now i realize and yes i agree with that rose However, a lot of people do hang on to that, and those people, the, we, we have to embrace those people as much as anybody else. And the the more of this information that continues to come out, the more people are going to start waking up to the, the reality of this. People are going to be asking rudimentary questions, you know, very basic questions that you may have heard a hundred or a thousand times. Be patient with those people. The, the people that know what's been going on for a long time are the people that that those new people, or we could call them newbies, um, not in a, a derogatory or disrespectful way, but they're just new to the topic. They're going to be turning to the, the people like Preston and other researchers, other experiencers, people that have put themselves out there in the public that have been trying to get this message out for so many years. Now the message is getting out there and people are going to start coming to you guys with questions. It's time to be patient. It's time to be understanding and embrace those people and help everybody get to a point where they feel safe and confident in a changing world. Uh, it's an it's a interesting time that we're alive to see this, man. And I'm grateful for it. And I'm grateful mostly for people like Preston and other, other researchers that have been doing this for so many years, because those are the people that are going to help kind of make this transition to a, a different type of world that we're going to see in the next, you know, two, three years, maybe five, 10 years at the most, but it's coming, it's going to happen. So uh, Preston, that is really my final thoughts, but I'd like to give you an opportunity to give your final thoughts on the conversation that we've had and and then we'll close it out okay yeah yeah thanks very much yeah thanks for having me on the show it's awesome um i do think ets are good news for humanity yes it's going to have a huge impact on religion on politics on medicine on business on all aspects of human society disclosure will happen it i think government our government in particular is going to drag their feet the whole way but it's inevitable that the truth comes out 
I think ETs will show themselves to humanity at large, probably within this generation, could be very soon. I mean, it's impossible, it's, it's pure speculation, but I can tell you that contactees are being told this, <laughs> that there is an agenda to do this, that there will come a day when it won't be a mystery. Every single person on this planet will know that this is a real thing, that human Manny is not alone. That is coming. Uh, I think it's inevitable. The cat's out of the bag. It's marching forward fast. Most people believe in this phenomena. A good portion have experienced it themselves. So ultimately, I think, yeah, this is good news for humanity. It's going to be a very different world. I'm pretty excited about it. It's a good time to be alive on Earth. Uh, we're probably going to go through some rough times as we figure out how to live in a more peaceful way and break off from the greed and corruption that's choking our society. But at some point, I think we're gonna have a new age. We're gonna have an age of enlightenment that is unparalleled in modern history. And I'm looking forward to that. I 100% agree with that, Preston. And I've been saying that for, for some time on my podcast that we, we are in the beginning stages uh, and if we're not, it's coming very soon that we're in, we're going to be experiencing a new renaissance. Um, you, you were talking about the ETs will show themselves. Uh, Chris Plain asked the question, does Preston think that ET will introduce themselves on a large, undeniable scale soon? Uh, and I think he answered that. But thank you so much for that question, Chris. Uh, and I'm glad you're here watching. Yeah, I hope it's this year or next year. I don't know, but I think it uh, is coming. Yeah. I can't imagine it's going to be another 20 years. There's just no way. Because uh, this phenomenon has just got so much pressure on it right now. <laughs> A lot of attention. It's a pretty exciting time. Uh, Photo 7 says, I heard we are you back from the future. We are searching for ourselves and our past history in the 70s. Is that Photo 7, is that something that you heard that other people, other experiencers have said, or is that something that you heard firsthand from an encounter that you had? Uh, I've, heard, I've heard this from several conductees. You are us, we are you um, in various forms. And I think what that is is a, a message of oneness and a, a message that, you know, we are all beings, intelligent beings in this right. universe. Right. I don't think it necessarily says, oh, we are, you know, directly related but it could could very well be um i think the grays are essentially human have very close to the same genetics uh chris plain says i'll see you face to face next week andrew he's not calling me out he and i are <laughs> he and our friends on twitter and he's going to be a guest on a um upcoming episode and uh Oh, so you're not going to have a fight on the playground after research. no not at all chris, chris is an awesome dude he's a science fiction writer <laughs> Uh, as you are, and he also writes for The Debrief, um, <clears throat> which is a great magazine, a great uh, online magazine. Um, Rich says, we are one with the one which is all. And yeah. Love that. Yeah. Um, We're all indivisible part of this universe. We're all of the same energy. And then... Uh, Rose says, I'd say we're getting right into the middle of the shift when things are completely confusing and nothing makes sense. And that may be true for a lot of people. And that's why I'm saying it's, it's important for people that do have understanding and have been looking at this for so long to be patient with those people that are just coming around to yeah. learning about this, this when reality. Your when your belief system collapses, <laughs> you have to restructure it. And that takes time to build. Absolutely. And you need a foundation to 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 uh, be able to build from, and that foundation is the the researchers and the people that have had this information and have been trying to disseminate the information for decades, um, such as yourself, Preston. Thank you for everything that you do, my friend. Thank you first and foremost for coming on my show. I'm so grateful and humbled, and appreciate the fact that you're willing to come here, share your ideas, your knowledge, your pers uh, perspectives on the topics that we're talking about. 
um, it's just, it's, it's awesome. Um, I, I, I call you friend. I think of you as a friend. Hey, I and, feel the same way. Thank I'm you, also man. grateful, honored, humble, whole deal. Yeah. And we'll do this again very soon. I, I, I love having you on here. I always learn something new from talking with you. Everybody in the chat room, thank you so much, guys, for being here. Appreciate your input. Uh, you know, it's it's great to hear comments and questions from the people that are watching. If you're watching this after it's uh, the live stream is over and you're watching the recording and you have questions, please drop them in the comments. Next time Pre Preston's on, I will address those questions with him in the future uh, episode. But, uh, oh, Preston, one, one last thing. Uh, let people know how they can reach out to you. For anybody that doesn't know, how can they contact you? Oh, yeah. I appreciate that. I do have a website. Just use a search engine on my name. It should take you there. And, yeah, if you have a comment or a question or a story you'd like to share, you can contact me through my website. I'm on Facebook. I'm Twittering now. I've got my own YouTube channel, putting out my research. Uh, so, yeah, I think this is an important subject. Thanks for having me on your show. It's always awesome. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I can't wait to see what happens next with this whole Same. thing. Yeah, me too, man. It's exciting times, and, and it seems to be changing daily. I mean, new information is coming out daily, and it's just uh, it's just a great time to be alive and to be aware. So, cool. All right, Preston, you have a great day. Happy 4th of July. Happy Independence Day to everybody. And um, I'll see you guys next time. Thank you for being here.